so anyone who's who wasn't here last week, we are on step six. We did the step six in the big book. We did part of the step six in the 12 and 12. It took us to a point in the 12 and 12 where it starts talking about the instincts. And then we read about the instincts in the step four. So now we're going to continue reading the step four and we'll kind of pull it all together as we read. And why I like to read the step four when we do step six there's some really good tangible evidence of how our defects, the more subtler ones, kind of fuck up our lives. And, you know, there's a saying that I say it's you can't see self from self. So what the step four and the 12 and 12 does, it starts exposing self that you can't see from self. Just gives you a heightened awareness of, uh, you know, selfishness, self-centeredness, self-centered fear, um, mind and emotional manipulation, this kind of thing. But we will pray like normal, Creator. Uh, thank you for this beautiful day today. Just ask for your grace today, Creator, as we go through this literature to try to expose the cunningness of our defects of character. Ask for your guidance and your clarity and the experience from my life through sponsorship in my own life of where these things kind of prey on me. Creator, I ask for your guidance in the words and watching my swearing. And I just ask for help for the people on the screen and for people in the world who are struggling with spiritual malady, whether they know it or don't know it. Creator, I ask that you shine a light into them. Guide them in a good way, in a sacred way, to, to a place of authentic truth of their self and to service of you creator i thank you for this journey of recovery that you've put me on i thank you for all the pain and hardships that you've given me so i could learn and grow from i ask you creator to keep that light shining for me allow me to listen to your voice and walk in a good way and i ask creator that you watch over the alcoholic and addict still suffering hi hi god thank you for time together thank you for the relationships we build in this program. Thank you for my dad today. Thank you that I got to spend time with him and that I have a relationship with someone like him. Um, it shows, shows me that there's value in going through things with someone and sticking by someone. And Thank you for so much, but thank you for helping me to come to you to slow things down and to calm down and that I can put time and space between things before I make decisions and that I have a way to solve problems even when I'm in a big emotion and thank you for my little toddler who teaches me a lot about his own emotions and what a blessing he's been be with him right now he's sick and be with my two teenagers they're navigating things in their own ways and thank you that they come to me and that I have a solution that I can give them when they have problems. And somehow that makes sense because it is the truth. I think that the solution you give us through truth and love feels like the truth and it's attractive to them. Mm. Thank you for the uncertainty that my life has some um, sense of adventure today that doesn't come from a substance. And Thank you for the people who know me, stand up for me, and are there for me, and I do the same for them, and the relationships, again, that you give us through this program that teaches us to show up for each other. Amen. Okay, let's fucking rock and roll. Okay, page 43 and, 43 and the 12 and 12. So... We just finished off reading about the instincts 
right? These instincts that are deep down within us, right? It's kind of like a tree. I'm going to go through the tree exercise here. So when you have a defect of character, the defect of character is the symptom of the instincts that are gone astray, right? So the defects are actually what cause our destructive drinking and our failure at life. And if we don't get a hold on these defects, sobriety and peace of mind elude us. And really, it's the peace of mind that eludes us, and we need to numb it out with a substance. So these things are vitally important to kind of identify and get a handle on with God and, and ask for some changes. And when you kind of think of like how this is, it's a tree. The branches are the defects, and the branches kind of extend out. And if you can kind of identify what the defect is, which is the branch, as you break an end of a branch, it's kind of easy to break, right? The end of the branch is kind of flimsy. Or it's dry and it's easy to snap. But the more you work your way in on the branch and you get closer to the trunk, the branch becomes harder to break. Well, that's the defect as it gets more cunning and it's harder to work, work with because you can't really see it and it's harder. It's more ingrained. And then as you kind of maybe work on that defect and you get to the trunk of the tree, now you're working your way down the trunk. And as the tree gets thicker, so does the defect of character because it's more solidified for various reasons. Um, maybe it's because it's been an awesome defense mechanism and it's kept you safe. Um, it's just something you've been using a long time. Maybe it's part of your subconscious and it doesn't really want to be seen because it is that protector. But then when you get below the surface of the tree, now you're into the roots. And remember, all trees have a root system that is twice as big as the tree that you see that sticks out of the ground. And in the root system underneath, it's dark, right? It's black. Well, that's kind of what is running our life. So in a tree, the tree only grows by what's below the surface. The nutrients in the earth and in the water, and that's all unseen. And that's kind of how these defects run. They run on the negative toxic nutrients below the surface and they kind of all extend and we talked about yesterday or last week about sex relation material emotional security and companionship these are the defects and the roots that are below the surface that we can't see and as these roots kind of go down into the dirt they kind of cross each other and they grow into each other so a lot of these instincts aren't like just linear one is a sex relation, one is an emotional security companionship or, or uh, you know, material security. They're not linear. They grow into each other and it gets really complex. So as you start healing the defects, you start healing the roots down below and you're healing not just something that might be sexual in nature, you're healing something that's more emotional in nature and um material in nature and all of these other things so the point is is when you start healing what's below the surface you're healing more than what you think 43 so before tackling the inventory problem in detail let's have a closer look at what the basic problem is simple examples like the following take on a world of meaning when we think about them suppose a person places sex desire ahead of everything in such case this imperious urge can destroy his chances for material and emotional security as well as st his standing in the community. Another may develop such an obsession for financial security that he wants to do nothing but hoard money. Going to the extreme, he can become a miser or even a recluse who denies himself both family and friends. Nor is the quest for security always expressed in terms of money. How frequently have we seen a frightened human being determined to depend completely on a stronger person for guidance and protection? This weak one, failing to meet life's responsibilities with his own resources, never grows up. Disillusionment and helplessness are his lot. In time, all his protectors either flee or die, and he is once more left alone and afraid. I'm going to come back to that paragraph. We have also seen men and women go power mad, who devote themselves to attempting to rule their fellows. These people often throw to the winds every chance for legitimate security and happy life. Whenever a human being becomes a battleground for the instincts, there can be no peace. But that is not all of the danger. Every time a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. 
If the pursuit of wealth tramples on people who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, and revenge are likely to be aroused. If sex runs riot, there's a similar uproar. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite domination or revulsion in the protectors themselves. Two emotions quite as unhealthy as demands which evoke them. When an individual's desire for prestige becomes uncontrollable, whether in the sewing circle or the international conference table, other people suffer and often revolt. This collision of instincts can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing revulsion. Revolution. In these ways, we are set in conflict, not only with ourselves, but with other people who have instincts too. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go back to page 43. Um, on the bottom paragraph, this is where we get into some more of the subtle aspects of the defect. So nor is the quest for security always expressed in terms of money. So in the column three in resentments, it talks about various things that are affected, it affects mine. One of the items in that third column is security. And it could be financial security, emotional security, um, physical security. It can be a, a wide array of different types of security in that third column. And I always say, like, you can work your first set of steps and work on that fourth column. Maybe you do two or three or five sets of steps and you're always focused on the fourth column. The message in the rooms is always focused on the fourth column. At some point after your second set of steps about, you have to start focusing on the third fucking column. But it switches itself, I think, kind of naturally because you stop doing things. It's like it's so subtle. You're not actually, you can't see your part because it doesn't look like you're actually doing anything, but you're restless, irritable, discontented. And it's because of the instincts in the third column. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what it is. That's why the third column becomes more important because you got to look. The fourth column is going to reveal itself because that's what everyone focuses on. And it's glaring. And then after a while, you stop doing that shit that you've identified already, and then it becomes subtle. And it's like, what, what, what's really going on here? And it's the, the, a lot of times it's the fear because you're not getting what you think you need or you want, or you're thinking you're going to lose what you have. And so you haven't actually done anything in column four. It's you're sitting in your fear of wanting to get something or not wanting to lose something. And for that reason, it's subtle. And so later on in recovery, the third column becomes the one we're working out of more often. Yeah, well, we should be. Mm -hmm. The thing about the program is most people don't because the program, when you go to step four meetings, all they ever talk about is my part, my part, my part. Well, I'm telling you guys on the screen that it, it becomes more than your part. Yes, it's your part, but you got to get to the root. So your part is the branch on the tree, but your fucking instincts or your desires are the third column and you got to find out why you're acting in the defect so the third column becomes more important okay so how frequently see a frightened human being determined to depend completely on a stronger person for guidance and protection so i'm going to use women for this example you can maybe agree or not agree but i'm sure you will and there's a lot of women out there that will seek a man for protection and they seek a man to be like taken under their wing in a sense, not every woman, like don't get me wrong, but there's a sense of security that a lot of women go for in a man. And they depend completely on this stronger person for guidance and protection. Take care of me in a financial way, take care of me in a physical way, give me all the things that I need and I'll just be loyal to you and I'll just kind of stand here in, in your shadow and I'm okay with that. And a lot of women are okay with that, okay? But this weak one, failing to meet life's responsibilities on their own resources. So then these two people who are like this, they go through years of being together. Maybe it's a couple of years, maybe it's many years. And the woman never really grows in life in her own resources on her own accord. And then the relationship gets destroyed. And then the woman's left there with no tangible skills in society. She doesn't have the ability to, to like thrive in society. Maybe she's a stay-at-home mom and she fucking had this expectation that 
this relationship was going to be like the last one in her life? Well, they didn't meet life on their own resources and they never grow up. How I read that is like also with when you say God as a resource and the resources in you, if a person gets into a relationship early on and, and they're using the, the man or in this example that you just gave as their resource, their higher power, and they're never learning to actually go to God and they, they use the relationship for the sense of ease and comfort eventually over time that doesn't do the trick and they've never learned to establish their own relationship with God. And so in more of just a society puts these norms on us to get into a relationship and to get into, you know, like the man providing and these roles that we have, we never learn to go to God first. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Okay. So this week one, failing to meet life's responsibilities on their own resources never grows up. So they never develop the tangible skills that they need to build to, to navigate life in their own way, okay? Disillusionment and helplessness are their lot. So they become very uh, confused and because they don't have the tools, they become kind of left behind and then they become confused and now they're looking for the next person or the next thing that's gonna take them and carry them and protect them. In time, all the protectors either flee or die. Because people don't want that type of dependency. People don't want that responsibility. A lot of toxic relationships when they first start, yeah, that's great. The guy really loves the woman that's really needy that wants them. But over time, that fails. And same with man and, or woman to man. But over time, that pressure and that carrying somebody along, it will fail, right? And he is once more left alone and afraid. And then they're alone again. And you can think of many women in this program, and I know some men who always end up alone and afraid. And then it's the next man again, or the next woman. And this is a cycle that's over and over and over. But to Janine's point, the real resource that they don't ever tap into is their own inner consciousness, their own God consciousness. So they never find their own truth and they never find their own confidence through their own resource. So I always kind of lay it out like this. Anybody in this world, you can do anything the fuck you want. That's my true belief. You can do almost anything that you want within reason. And it's not that you're, you can't do something because you're lacking resources out there right? Oh, I can't do this because I don't have money. Oh, I can't do this because I don't have that. I don't have the right connections. I don't have this. I don't have that. So we give up on our dreams. We give up on our, our path of what we really want. Well, if you have that one resource that's deep inside of you, and you tap into that unsuspected inner resource, and you really become who you're supposed to be, and you go down the path of whatever it is you want, the resources outside of you start delivering themselves to you so you can find the path of your truth of, of where you want to be and who you want to be. And I found that to be a fucking truth big time. So the real resource that we need to tap in here, here is the resource of God within us. And there's another line in we, we agnostics that kind of taps in on this that if you can think honestly, if you can search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. Um, with this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. As you do all this work and you find these defects and you find all the things that aren't God, and you, you discard them, you find that fucking peace. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. And then that guides you everywhere. So... Do you want to talk any more about that paragraph before I flip over? Nope. Okay. And then it goes on to say, these people often throw to the winds every chance of legitimate security and happy family life. Whenever a human being becomes a battleground for the instincts, there can be no peace. So within the being of the human, when they become the battleground for the instincts, they're trying to like grasp and go and take and trying to fix all the things that are broken in them through things that are outside of them. And then that's like the battleground of the instincts within them. There can be no peace. And if there's no peace inside, the brain starts fucking going nuts. 
and and we're just grasping at everything to try to make us okay on the inside whether it's money whether it's a job whether it's a relationship whether it's sex whether it's porn whether it's gambling and most of what i'm talking about especially for for us humans is you know relationships and sex and money and material and houses and jobs and these kind of things because we're a delusion that we can find happiness and satisfaction out of these things if we only manage it well. But that's not all of the danger. Every time a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. If the pursuit of wealth tramples upon people who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, and revenge are likely to be aroused. If sex runs wide, there's a similar uproar. So I'm going back. If a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. So what's a good example of that? So let's say I'm pursuing a woman, okay? And and I kind of get in there a little bit. She doesn't know me very well, but I kind of get in there a little bit. And we're starting to date. And things are going not bad because it's so surface level. You know, finally, she lets me give her a kiss and we were kind of, you know, moving down that path. But because I'm super needy, now I'm going to impose my instincts on her. I'm going to be like, hey, like, what are you doing? And what time are you you going to work tomorrow? And like, now it becomes like, so it becomes like over excessive communication. And like, you know, I I want to know what time you're going to bed. And I want to know what time you're getting up. I want to know what you had for supper. I want to know, like when you're going to work out and and the person that I'm texting this to they're like holy fuck this is a lot and then maybe I see them and then the first thing they do is they fucking put their arm around me and they don't even give me a chance to breathe and I'm fucking in the car driving with them and they're grabbing my hand and like now I'm I'm imposing my instincts upon them what are the instincts I'm imposing my instincts for emotional security for companionship there's a little bit of sex relation in there. Um, maybe I want to drive my car, not hers, because my car looks nicer. So there's a little bit of emotional security there because I want to look good as I'm driving with this woman. Or maybe it's at the office and and I want to make more money and I'm in competition with other people who are at work. And like I've been there longer and these two new people get hired and now I start kind of imposing my will on my boss and like really trying to show them like, look how good my work is. And when I know the other people's work is just as good and they kind of come in and they're, they're just being themselves. I'll try to talk shit about, about these people because I'm in fear that they're going to take my spot. I've been here a while and I want that next raise. I want the next little bit of, you know, bump up the ladder here. So I'm imposing my instincts. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my position and I'm not going to get something. And so now I'm imposing my instincts on my boss and these other people because it's an energy. And now they just kind of, they don't really like it. My boss is kind of like, whoa, whoa, like fucking, you know, and then I'm the guy who doesn't get the raise. And then I'm fucking resentful thinking like, holy shit, like you guys can't even see the value in me. And then I start getting resentful, right? The selfish, self-centered nature and all of that. And I could go on and on and on. It happens within just male-on-male peer groups where I have a best friend. We've been best friends for a while. My best friend meets a good guy and they become friends. Now I'm jealous that my buddy's friends with somebody else. So now I start snubbing my other buddy and maybe his new friend gives me a call and I just ignore it. And I don't even tell my, my buddy that his new friend called me. And his new friend just wants to fucking hang out. But I'm like, I'm so scared. I'm living in fear. And the instincts are becoming a battleground. And there can be no peace within me. Okay. Um, And like, go ahead. Paradoxically, you end up causing the fear to come to surface. Like, like attracts like. And you put that out there. And what happens is the other person or the boss, they're, they're repelling from that energy. Like if we want to talk energy, anything under 200 is a, a repulsion and, and that type of vibe with the fear that's there. And then people like feel the energy sucking from them and they repel. And so in a relationship that plays out like um, the, the 
person pulls back. And then what happens? The needy person comes at it even harder because they sense them pulling back. So then they, and, and they cause their own fate. And then that reaffirms their fear and they get more and more unwell, you know, like it's like, oh, I am, un I am worthless. I am. So the next relationship, they're feeling that much more insecure and they go at it that much more needier. And they're causing these, these things to become ingrained over the course of their life, because that's the pattern. So when, by the time you get into program, you've got these thick patterns and, and people have proven to themselves through that exact pattern. Like I am worthless. Everybody leaves me. This always happens. Everybody cheats, everybody, everybody, but you're having the same experience with different people because of kind of what it said in the four, in the step four in our book, it's like, when we only look at what everyone else is doing, what happens, we, we stay sore and the world continues to wrong us because we're not looking at our own part and we're not seeing where our instincts are causing our failure. And, and that's the important part. And, and the key to the solution is because once we can see the thing that we're doing is actually creating this reality, whether we want to look at it like we get the ball rolling or, and then we cause our own fate. So, so anyway, Janine was talking about kind of like doing these behaviors and then grabbing at more and trying to redouble our efforts. So when we're kind of thinking, let's go back into step three in the big book, not literally, but let's think about what step three is the actor. You know, trying to arrange life to suit themselves. If everyone would just do as they want, our actor might be sometimes quite generous, modest, self saccharine kind, giving, forgiving. He's going to try to get his way by using like seemingly principles. And then if he doesn't get his way, he can be mean, egotistical, um, agitated, fucking whatever type of mood we can, we'll try to draw and get what we want anyway. Right. And then the, sh the show doesn't come off right because we're not getting it our way. So then he becomes on the next occasion even more generous or more ignorant, whatever the case may be. So basically what these defects are is it's us trying to be the actor. And then we redouble our efforts and we try to grab and, and grasp and take more. And a lot of this isn't done like. When we're looking for these defects, we don't know, we can't always see them because some of it's so subtle. Okay. And it's like, it's in your body language, it's in your face language, it's in the eye rolls, it's in all of these things. Okay. And we really got to be mindful of what we're doing. So I'm going to go back to the top of 44. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite domination or revulsion in the protectors themselves. So going back to my example where it's a woman and a man, and the woman's the weaker one in the relationship, and they're looking for the man, for the man for some protection and guidance. And that relationship builds like that, where she kind of caters to the man. And Maybe she's really needy, like she really needs love and she needs attention. And, you know, the guy kind of liked that at first. But as time went on, this guy ends up getting like repulsed. It, it, that type of behavior will only invite domination or revulsion. And think about it in your own lives where you were like really like somebody and you would fucking do almost anything. And you, you got to the point where they either dominated you or they repelled you, you repulsed them because it turns out to be pathetic, right? And those relationships run rampant everywhere we go. And like, there's men and women that will both do these over excessive actions in their subconscious and in their behaviors to try to get more love out of somebody. Like I'm going to share like an example in my past life when I was dating somebody else. Um, this other person would want my attention. So they would like text me, okay, what time are you going to be home? I want to see you. And I'd be like, well, I'm going to be home at five. Okay. And then I'd be home at 10 after five. And then I'd get the cold shoulder and I'd get snub. And then I'm like trying to overcompensate I'm trying to be super nice now to try to get the love and affection and attention that I that I thought I'd get normally. But because her instincts were 
like she wanted what she wanted and she didn't get me home at five. I was home at 10 after five. She became like a bitch to me and I just wanted love. So then I fucking catered to like her, her fucking bullshit, but there can be no peace in that. Basically I'm selling out my fucking soul for this piece of fucking love that it's not even real love. And when I added up enough of that shit over the years, my whole self-confidence and my self-esteem was just fucking shot because I put all my stock into this relationship that wasn't even fucking healthy. But every now and then it seemed like it was healthy or it seemed like it was okay, but it never fucking ever stayed okay. And I always sold more and more of my soul apart for this fucking relationship. And I got to the point where I didn't even want to look people in the eye. Because I would fucking abandon my friends for this relationship. I would fucking abandon a lot of my work. It was like a different type of addiction in a sense. And it made my life really unmanageable. But because I had brought, been brought up in a certain way of how relationships were, I kind of just accepted it and I wanted it. But I didn't really want it. But I couldn't let go of it. It was fucking hard to let go of. I didn't fucking love myself enough. But through enough work with my sponsor and self-inventory and more relationship with creator, I finally was able to fucking break that off. And, you know, I've never looked back from it. Anyway, got anything on too much demands made upon other people? I was just reading where you cut off the highlights, the emotions being unhealthy. But when it says the, the revulsion part, it reminds me of uh, what my grandma used to say, which I consider kind of the spiritual laws and it was that your heart can't serve two masters she said you'll end up you know loving one and despising the other and that's how it how it plays out in like the things we love in life you know and it and it goes like that you can't have two things be at the center of your heart whether that's like two relationships and an affair or if it's like money versus your home life or you just cannot hold two things to the same esteem like it, it doesn't work out and you end up one of them pays because you resent it the thing that gets in the way of what's number one so anything that gets in the way of what's number one in your heart is going to cause you a problem and if it's not a higher power you blow in the wind trying to to grab out whatever it is to remedy the emotional security we're all looking for at the end of the day so that's kind of what i was thinking is just how and anything that we put before our recovery, I guess in recovery language, we lose. Uh, so kind of same, same. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any comments on that? Anyone live experience of that? I really, uh, I kind of have some experience in that. Yeah, I really like what Janine said. It, it, I could feel it, it makes sense to me. I, I've been in that position where, um, I, I've been, I was in recovery. I was growing with creator. I was doing the deal. And then I made that, that, that emotional security. I, I, I needed it. I was sick without it. I felt I was, I was in fear and I made women um, more important than my creator. I, I focus. And, and what I mean by made them more important is I focus more attention on, on uh, the woman that was in my life, the, the women um, in this, this handful of years I've been around and, and I don't know if I resented God, but I just, there was no God. He was only there when I was fucking going through crazy shit. Um, so yeah, I, I, I could feel that uh, um, in my own experience when, when I focus too much on women or even work. When I work 12, 14 hour days, six day weeks, I didn't pray enough. I didn't sponsor. I didn't, I lost my purpose and, and, and ultimately it drove me into a spiral of, of defect, shame, guilt, um, and, and just taking my will back and trying to grasp at, 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 at that woman and that, that, that emotional security to, to fill that void. And, and it was never filled. Um, so yeah, I feel that. You talked about what the book says, right? Where he was saying that he was calling on God in a pinch, like the Bush lead league pinch hitter where God becomes a thing that we're just calling on when we've screwed ourselves over and we're needing the help. And um, that, that is like a common theme with relationships. It's like things go good till they don't. And, and it's, I, I still believe like in early recovery until, until we go through enough stuff that we have to actually struggle and go into the unknown in a way. 
um, by ourselves where God's the only thing we actually have to grab at. If we're lucky enough to get those situations early on, otherwise it's like, God, how can God be a thing that we've actually had to really depend on a hundred percent if the situation hasn't, hasn't showed itself. So, you know, I, I see like how a relationship comes along and people can go down the path. Like, this is good. This is good. And over time, God becomes the pinch hitter and then the relationship falls apart because it was never two whole people coming together. It was two broken people coming together from their defective place. And that doesn't last. And then, and then, you know, if you're lucky to stay sober through that, but a lot of times, you know, it's, it's not. And Bill used to always tell me like, this kills people. This is the actual thing that kills people. Cause guys go out and, and don't come back over a relationship falling apart. We were just talking about that actually. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it happens a lot. So anyways. Okay. Bill, Bill saved me a few times actually from, from almost relapsing because of, of emotional and relationship stuff. Um, so, so I get that totally, but I think us real deal alcoholic addicts for my own experience, I had to go through those things to, to, to get, mm-hmm. to get a deeper understanding and faith in God. I don't know if I could have just did them without going through those experiences. Yes, those experiences were tough, challenging, trying, almost fucking send me back out. But I'm a real deal fucking junkie. I need to feel, I need to hurt before I learn. So, um, yeah, it's my experience. It's made me stronger because I've stayed committed to seeking God's will for me and doing this deal. But I needed to go through those things. Well, I think, yeah, like you bring up a good point, because just like the alcohol where we need to be convinced, you know, like it says, we have to be convinced like that, that anything that we're doing without God's help is not going to be successful. And I was convinced already coming in because I could see it in my own like relationship life, the way that the relationships were just unhealthy and, and I couldn't get out of them. Like I was like, this is not a good scenario. I don't want this around my kids. I don't want that, you know, and yet I did. And it was like, I could see my powerlessness in that and, and that the moral and philosophical convictions galore in my area of relationships. I wanted a certain thing, but I couldn't ever get there and I couldn't ever get out of it. And so I was powerless against my own relationship choices, whether I was drinking or not drinking. And I could see that. So coming into the program, I think like I had, a, I had like, I was convinced and part of that, that the nail in the coffin was was talking with Bill about just like the actually the energy stuff and just the way that codependency shows up and and I was convinced through my past experiences but also in reading what the book says about this in the ways that it doesn't actually say it but it's saying it and I knew like that that's true and I needed to just be on my own and and I had enough of my own painful experience to draw from and I needed that to be convinced. So the defects are the same as the alcohol is that we have to be kind of beaten and bludgered into a place of reasonable <laughs> or admission where we're saying, yes, like I see that I'm licked in this area too. And that's it. Like all of the book, all of the big book actually goes in alignment with these defects of character. You know, I'm powerless over my thinking and my behaviors and my emotions and my ideas. And the alcoholic at a certain point has no effect of mental defense against the first what? Drink? No, think. And once that think starts going, and we haven't identified like, uh, we don't have the awareness in these thoughts of and we don't have enough inventory to see some of the patterns and we haven't been to big book studies like this that are kind of identifying those things we just keep going through life running our fucking lives fucking thinking that we're in god's fucking will going down the path where i'm trying to get what i fucking want still and i'm still trying to manipulate and grab and pull and fucking mind and emotionally manipulate the world to deliver me what it is I think I want. And I keep fucking crashing into people, places and things. And I'm like, holy fuck, this is hard. No, it's way fucking harder because you haven't fucking learned how to turn it over yet. How do you turn it over? Awareness has to be number one. Mm -hmm. Without awareness, then there's no fucking willingness because you think you're doing God's will. Mm -hmm. That's why step 10 is so important to follow exactly what it says. That's why it's so important to start focus on 
third column stuff. That's why it's so important that we go through like this step four stuff as part of the step six. So we can see some of these subtler things that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis where we don't even have a second thought of what we're doing, right? And as we become aware, then we can go, fuck, this is what they were talking about. And then step 10 has a whole new fucking value to it and it changes your life, right? The way that I saw it early on was like, I, I had a epiphany of sorts when um, I realized like step one, two, three was kind of like the surrender with the alcohol and I'm willing to try something else. But, but then the, then four, five, six, seven was kind of the same sort of process as one, two, three, but it was, I'm drinking from the cup of self glug, glug, glug. And it was all of my defects that were getting me wasted and taking me on sprees and taking me out of myself. So I didn't have to experience myself and giving me that escape and giving me that instant gratification and that sense of ease and comfort and it had nothing to actually do about with the alcohol at all I was just drinking from the cup of self glug 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 and once I realized you know like geez like it's it's the same like you get the alcohol out of the way and here we are and I kind of see it now like I spend a lot of time like getting people to see like to be convinced that any any life run on self will not be a success and it might take a long time you know, it could take a long time. People, I've seen people take a long time. And then, you know, Bill and I have had lots of conversations about this, what that looks like in the end. And Bill was saying to me, you know, it looks like people not knowing how to even check their inventory. They don't know why they're, you know, they're on their deathbeds going, holy shit, what was that? Feeling a certain way and trying to give money and give gifts. And they don't know what they're apologizing for, but they feel like they're tormenting inside. And, you know, like that, that sounds like hell on earth to me. But the, the point is that, you know, the the way that I saw it, it, it's like you need a step one kind of around the defects. And that's the four, not to complicate it, but you got to have the same amount of like step one on your own defects. And so to really spend time on the three and four and like the the actor piece in three for me was was really big because that that is how I I used that little actor guy to to see myself in the four and how I was doing those things. And today that looks like, you know, I get a kick out of my two-year-old because he's, he's, he's like the little ego. And it's so funny because he'll think he wants something, you know, like he's like, I want whatever it is. And then if he doesn't get it, he has this like expression. And then if he doesn't get it, he goes at it harder. And then it turns into like this fake cry. And then I'll be like, Hey, enough. Like we're not, this isn't what we're doing. Like come on, let's put your shoes on, whatever, whatever. And he'll see that I'm a little bit annoyed. And then he'll come to my face and go, mommy, are you okay? Mommy, I love you. I'm Maisie Bear, right? And he's being charming and he's being a certain way and he's trying. And then I'll be like, yeah, let's put your shoes on. And then he'll be like, can I have a cheese string? Or whatever he's trying to get. And it's like, he's just being a little actor trying to get what he wants. And I can see him flipping through the exact things. Like I'm going to be like this and I'm going to try that. And it makes me laugh, but because that's like, we in some ways never grow up past those toddlers and we come in and we're doing the same sort of shit. So this is the program that grows us up and gets us to see ourselves like a little toddler in the ways that we're stomping around, making demands and having temper tantrums. And I love that because I always say whatever year you are in your sobriety is how old yeah. you are as like a fucking kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah, accurate. Because we're growing up and learning and, you know, <laughs> emotionally we're fucking children and we start growing up learning this stuff so before we go for a break let's finish this paragraph so when an individual's desire for prestige becomes uncontrollable whether in the sewing circle or at the international conference table other people suffer and often revolt this collision of instincts can produce can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing revolution in these ways, we are set in conflict, not only with ourselves, but with other people who have instincts too. So this is uh, this is kind of an interesting one. It's talking about prestige or status or validation. Think about it. It's prestige, status, or validation within your peer group of women or men, your sports team at work, in the program. Fucking it can be anywhere. And whether it's in the sewing circle or at the international conference table, 
And in the step 10, in the 12 and 12, it talks about big shotism, okay? And big shotism is somebody who kind of puts himself above and now the ego is like really self-righteous. So I'm going to share a story that happened to me years ago that I was the big shot and what happened. And this kind of goes in all areas of your life. It can be in their family. It can be anywhere. So I was playing pool and I love playing pool. And I went there with a whole bunch of guys from the program. And there must have been about six or seven of us. And we were all playing pool. We went to a bar and the bar was fairly busy. And I'm pretty good at pool and I can really run the table and kind of kick some ass, right? And so this night I was kicking some ass and as fucking really cocky and, you know, I was single. So, and there was chicks all over the place and fucking, you know, I was just mingling in and out. And this one chick kept coming over and then I'd go and talk to her over somewhere else in between my shots. And then my buddies were at the table going, where the fuck is he? And then they'd come and get me and then I'd come and I'd shoot and then I'd go back over and hang out with these chicks and then I'd come back and shoot and I'm fucking annoying my buddies because it's busy and people want to play pool and I'm just fucking doing whatever I want right I'm winning at pool I'm winning with the chicks I'm just fucking winning everywhere and then I come back to the pool table and they fucking reset the game and fuck it was my table and they said no, bro, you weren't paying attention. So we just reset the game and now you're not playing. And I'm like, fuck you. That was my fucking table. And I start like giving them the gears and blah, blah, blah. And then all my buddies are just like, you know what? Have your fucking table. And they fucking threw the sticks down and they all fucked off and left me there. And I'm sitting there at the pool table with this chick. I don't know. All my buddies are gone and I feel like a total piece of shit now. And I realized that big shotism, that status, that that stuff, right? It left me alone and afraid. And then I owed amends later and I had to make amends. But that's kind of an example, right? An individual's desire becomes uncontrollable, whether at the sewing circle or at the international conference table. So I was just showing everyone how fucking styling I was, right? And I ended up fucking underneath the heap showing them how selfish you are (laughs) yeah how selfish i was how selfish and self-centered and i gotta watch that right that's like what i have to watch in my life even in this program as a as i kind of do this stuff i have to really be mindful and fucking really be careful because i can actually push people from around me all away from me So I try to stay really grounded. I try to stay humble. I work with my sponsor. I work with my culture. I do a lot of things to try to stay fucking grounded and not get out of control. Because that's the ego and that's self and fuck. That'll take me right back to a fucking crack pipe. So I do a pretty good job most of the time. And I don't do that much anymore. I've learned a lot of hard lessons, right? But you know, that can happen in other places, too. When I read that paragraph, I actually think of a friend of mine who she uh, lives on a colony and she actually talks about, you know, things that come up when they're sewing. And, and I read that as like whether you're like a, a big dog making millions of dollars doing things that you think are so important or whether you're repairing a hole in some jeans with your your girlfriends um jealousy and big shotism and trying to do it better and the competition those things can creep in and repel others because if you're if we're not looking for uh the source or a bigger direction than just our own direction then we're going to be in collision and bouncing off of other people who are also doing their own thing trying to come at things with their own fears and instincts gone astray and so everybody's in and and I I think of just like that hairdresser story with my mom you know like that how much collision she had by just not saying no to the hairdresser and had this big whole commotion going and everybody there was jumping on board and nobody was things get so simple if we're looking to the same place for the answers but when we try to solve things ourselves, it becomes so complicated and we all think we know best 
and it, it and it, it's like our best intentions create you know havoc a lot of times are we not the producer of confusion even though we're trying to you know do our best and try to bring peace we create confusion why because we're trying to direct the show and that's not our job because we can't see the big picture only like god can see the whole or the source or whatever you want to call it can see whatever the bigger thing is out there that thing can see everything and how it connects and the way that the dominoes lay down and the way that when you move one thing the ripple effect over here and how this all plays out and we can't we just see our own things that we think is best with our small human mind and so of course in that way we're stepping on toes and uh, the best intentions still cause chaos we're on the bottom of 44 do you want to read sure i brought you a book yeah all right Alcoholics especially should be able to see that the instinct run wild in themselves is the underlining cause of their destructive drinking. We have drunk to drown out feelings of fear, frustration, and depression. We have drunk to escape the guilt of passions, and then we have drunk again to make more passions possible. We have drunk for vainglory that we might have might enjoy foolish dreams of pomp and power. This perverse soul sickness is not pleasant to look at. Instincts on rampage bulk at, upon investigation. The minute we make a serious attempt to probe them, we are liable to suffer severe reactions. If temperamentally we are on the depressive side, we are apt to be swamped with guilt and self-loathing. We wallow in this messy blog, often getting a mishap and painful pleasure out of it. As we morbidly pursue this melancholy activity, we may sink to such a point of despair that nothing but oblivion looks like a possible solution. Here, of course, we have lost all perspective and therefore all genuine humility. For this is pride in reverse. This is not a moral inventory at all. It is the very process by which depressive has led has often been led to the bottle and extinction. If, however, our natural disposition is inclined to self-righteousness or grandiosity, our reaction will be just the opposite. We will be offended at AA's suggested inventory. No doubt we shall point with pride the good lives we had thought we'd led before the bottle cut us down. We shall claim that our serious character defects, if we think we have any at all, have been caused chiefly by excessive drinking. This being so, we think it logically follows that the sobriety, first, last, and all the time, is the only thing we need to work for. We believe that our one good, one-time good characters will be revived the minute we quit alcohol. If we were pretty nice people all along, except for our drinking, what is the need for a moral inventory now that we're sober? Okay, over to 44. Okay. So alcoholics especially should be able to see that instinct run wild in themselves is the underlying cause of their destructive drinking. So it's those instincts that are running wild. That's the primary cause of our destructive drinking and our failure at life. So as we work with these instincts that are fucking like in on rampage, we're working as the actor trying to run the show. We're trying to control. We're trying to manipulate the world. We're trying to like, self will everything and that is basically self and if i operate in self long enough i will drink so when we talk about the alcoholic cycle way back in the doctor's opinion i'm restless irritable discontent unless i can again experience a sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by whatever it is i saw julie put in the chat earlier she goes on sprees of relationships and that spree of the relationship we're powerless over getting into that because it kind of medicates the emotional security the sex relation the material security and the companionship that we're longing for the thing about it is because it's so based in fear it'll eventually fail and the shine wears off because the alcoholic only gets relief out of it and the relief think about relief relief only lasts for a little while and then we're on to the next shiny thing or the new relationship or the new car or whatever the new job okay it can be whatever it is in that alcoholic cycle and then the other parts of that alcoholic cycle is as we succumb to the desire again so we succumb to the desire for getting in the relationship or getting changing jobs or anger or whatever so we don't have the power because we succumb to it and we're actually driven by the instincts that we can't even see. But as we make these decisions in the outer world, you know, we have plausible excuses for everything that we do. 
And I always say the alcoholic is incapable of honesty of on their own because they can rationalize and justify the most errant nonsense to suit their actions and their inaction in their life. And if you're justifying the most errant nonsense in your life to suit whatever it is you're doing, you're probably running in self, which is why it's so important for us to like rely on our pillars and our inventory, this program to expose these things and be rigorously honest with ourselves. Sometimes to get rigorously honest with myself, because I'm so diluted by my own bullshit and I can't even see it. I need somebody else to fucking get honest and help me so that I can see it. And even at first, I might not even see what the fuck they're even seeing. But as I get more fluent in this program and time goes on, I start to see this in a deeper sense. And then I start really feeling some peace and some serenity. So go ahead. What he was just talking about was instincts that are on rampage balk at investigation, right? So if somebody confronts us, um, the first thing that the ego is going to do is fight back. And so again, I use the analogy of the wicked witch of the West there and pouring water on it. And it's going to shriek and it's going to be like, Wah! I'm melting. And it's going to have that big commotion. And I think of that every time that something, somebody calls out my ego, that, that knee jerk reaction, if I can catch it, which I, I think I'm decent at, if I can catch it now, um, I, I still feel that wicked witch of the West syndrome inside of myself where it's shrieking and it's wanting to fight back. And this, this program, the literature, like it, it just gives all the answers, right? So when I feel that, Step 10 tells me like, that's me. That's my spiritual axiom. That's that, that is me telling it me that it's me. So the defensiveness that a person feels that I feel like if, if a person feels defensive, it's because there's something to defend. So if you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing, right? So it's like, when you have something to defend, your ego tells you because he's trying to protect or it's trying to protect the, the defects that that it thinks is keeping us better, the instant gratification, just like we defended so hard that solution of alcohol and, and to admit and to concede to our innermost self. We have to do the same concession on our defects. And that's not, that's not easy. And it's not like, oh, you saw that I was a certain way. Oh, okay, good. Thanks for pointing that out. There's a emotional turmoil before the surrender. And, and when you get the handle on this stuff, it's actually just little lights on the dashboard and it's nothing to really freak out over. It's just part of the process. Um, when we were reading this, I was thinking about um, a couple of things like this, if temperamentally we're on the depressive side and working with people, people who are on the depressive side and doing like a, a step five stuff or like calling out the defects, it doesn't look the same as if you have somebody who's like, like prideful, like it's talking about where you have to really say like, you know, there, there's a different way of doing it. And I would say like, not a softer, but a, it's, it looks softer, I guess, but also like a hard approach with, you know, I had somebody who was posting on social media all the time, self, self pity, and it was just keeping this person stuck. And it was like, you know, when you're on the depressive side, that, that defect of self pity, there's nothing like it that is so powerful that you know, you can go up to the bar of defects and say, hey, bartender, I need a glass of self-pity. And then he lines you up your shot. And he's like, it must be your fucking birthday. Let me get you one. And everyone lines up and everybody's giving you the shots of self-pity because it feels like they should. Like, poor me, this is what happened. And even if it's something tragic and, you know, you put it up on social media and everybody comes along and they send you the emoji hugs and it's this and it's that. And it's like, that's not the solution. And, and that's instant gratification. You feel better for a moment. And then you're left with self and self-pity. And it is a very, very low vibration, like very low. So it's underneath anger. It's like, it's it's so low, you guys, like it, it's hard to get motivated. So if you feel anger, that's motivating. Like you can do, you can do a lot with anger because there's a charge there. But when you slip into like the apathy and the, the self-pity stuff, like, you're getting lower and lower on the energy vibrations. And like, when you get down into guilt and shame and stuff, like we're talking, like you're, you're just like, you're barely dead or you're barely alive. Like 20 is the lowest there that, that we can measure. And this stuff is real. Like science shows this. And so self-pity is such a low energy and it's hard to motivate yourself. So 
when you go to that, that take a shot of the defects and it's self pity in the glass, like you're really setting yourself up to go on some type of insidious spree. That's really hard to see. And anyway, so we had this conversation and, and it made sense. And they changed that that day. They never did that again. And, and it's made a huge difference, a huge difference in their recovery and a huge difference in like how often they slip into the depressive state in the first place. And the second thing I was thinking is just that um, I remember the first time that I like that the, the mental blank spot really clicked and the being without a defense against the first drink that whole thing made sense because I thought it was like okay I'm going to be out and about and then suddenly I'm going to be in a liquor store and I thought that was kind of how it went but there's that emotional relapse kind of before that happens and and that's where you leave yourself wide open for this mental blank spot and I remember I was in Medicine Hat and I was <clears throat> it was raining and I was going to the courthouse and I'd fallen into this depressive stuff and and uh Bill had texted me and he said this, he's like, go to page 45, the first paragraph and read it. And that was it. That's all he said. And then I was reading it and I was like, oh my God, this morbidly pursuing this melancholy activity. I'm like, that's me sinking into a point of despair that nothing but, a oh my God, this is me. And I was like, you know, it says the mishap and painful pleasure out of it. That's me. You can get actual pleasure out of this self-pity. It's pretty messed up. And so I read that and I was like, oh my God. And then I was sitting outside of the courthouse and, and like reading this on my phone. And it was like, oh my God, I just had this moment where everything clicked. And I was like, this is how people get drunk is they stay in this emotional state, this, this bad place. And they don't do the things they don't even maybe notice um, that this is a thing, you know, like, thank goodness I just read it in here and I understand that I need to do something. And so I said to, to him, like, this is me, what do I do? And he's like, do whatever you need to do here. Pray and do something helpful. He's like, take your kid to the park. And I was like, it's raining. And I was like, oh. And so I took him to the park and uh, we went outside. And, and then by the time we got back to the house, it, I was out of that, that zone. But I, it had gotten to the point that I didn't even want to pick up the phone. Like I'd, I'd fallen so far into this depressive place. And I saw like for the first time, I was like, holy crap. Like, that's how it happens. That's where I would have been at, at, like, it was only a matter of time before suddenly I'm drunk, because that was where I was wide open. Because when things are going like, like, okay, I'm not in that emotional bit, but I can get in the emotional bit. And then if I don't do the things I need to do, like, like, call somebody like step tens around it, or if I stay in it too long, or if I'm doing the Facebook stuff on self pity, this and that and drinking the shots of defects there. And you know, if I do those things, I'm going to get drunk because I'm getting so close to the tipping point. So my emotional sobriety now is like, I see that that's the barometer of like where, where I'm at. And when I start slipping into a danger zone, I can catch it like before it becomes like a red line alarms going off. And, and I, and I've learned how to do that because of the literature where I really identify with that. I'm like, huh, that's the thing, you know, like going back to the idea of like a step one understanding around our defects, like this was part of mine where I saw I'm like, okay, like, this makes total sense. I see like, I see myself in this, I see how this is like, affects my life. And, and there's a difference for once I read it and identify it, just like we're trying to qualify an alcoholic in the way that we do in step one, this is kind of like how I was qualifying my own experience with my defects and becoming convinced, like I need to do something totally different, because I'm going to take myself out. And I will be without a defense one day, and I will be drunk. And then like, I, I just can't imagine what that would do because I I didn't have I was convinced in step one that I didn't have that option for myself because I don't know how to come out of it again and so yeah so that was the process for me and what came up in that paragraph okay so she touched on a lot there I'm just going to try to touch on a couple things so at the bottom of 44 instincts on rampage Bach and investigation she did a good job on laying out like what that looks like and I'll kind of just kind of touch on that a little bit more. So when we're confronted with a defect, um, instincts will balk at that investigation. It doesn't want to be seen. The instinct or the ego that's using that as a coping mechanism or, a, or a, you know, good intention in their life, once they're called out on it, it doesn't want to be seen. So you'll see somebody who's maybe in their first six months sober and they vowed they're staying out of a relationship for now and then they get in one. 
and now they're being confronted by their sponsor or maybe other people in the program are like, no, no, you're, you know, but they don't want to look at it. That instinct's going to balk at being investigated. They may distance themselves from their sponsor, which is normally what happens. The person will slowly get into a relationship because the instinct is driving them powerfully, blindly, and subtly. And then they start distancing themselves from their sponsor and the people who are there to hold them accountable. And then as the minute we make a serious attempt to probe them, we are liable to suffer severe reactions. So once we start probing these defects, because our pride is so attached to that mechanism, we start suffering severe reactions and we don't like it. So when I talk about humility at three levels, the first level might be humiliation, where we're probing maybe one of your behaviors or one of your belief systems. And like for me, you know, maybe it was like money or, or a job. And like, I think this is really good for me. And now somebody's probing that. And I'm like, no, fuck you. My whole family relies on me making money here. I need to take this job. But my sponsor can see that I'm really grasping and latching on to something that's probably not healthy, depending on what the job is or what the circumstance is, relationship or whatever it is. And then so I suffer severe reactions to that. And then eventually, if I'm open enough and willing enough and honest enough, and I hear my sponsor out, it changes me a bit and I can kind of see what he's talking about. And then I'm like, okay, okay. So at first, it's the humiliation of maybe admitting that or being poked on that. And then eventually, I kind of see the reason because I realize this guy loves me and he's just trying to help me. And then now I fucking don't take that job or I don't get in that relationship. But now I'm being humbled through the pain because I really thought that that was going to save me or give me the out that I needed. Or that was the fucking the gold golden goose that was going to fucking take me to the next level in my rebuilding of my life. But now I put that to the side and now I'm like, holy fuck. Look at all these other guys making all this money and now I don't get to. Look at all these other guys getting in these relationships and now I don't get to. And then I stand in that and I walk with my sponsor and there's a lot of fucking pain and humiliation in that. And maybe some other jobs and some other relationship opportunities come up as I'm walking this path. And I already know I got to say no to that stuff. So now I'm walking this path grudgingly. I'm just like, fuck, man, this is fucking not fun. And that's the, the humbling through the pain. But I don't really get it yet because I'm still, I haven't learned enough about humility yet. But I trust my sponsor and I kind of keep moving in that direction. I think another thing that that's happening when our defects are getting challenged by someone is, you know, like in step two, we talk about like old beliefs and and how those actually are you know they get in the way and they drive us and whatever else but when when we're getting called out on something it it's a, it's a shock to the, you know your ego but it's also to your psyche because it's challenging what you think you believe and like what you think is going to be good for you and what, what what you think you're supposed to be doing and what you think is like some sort of something that that is going to give you what you think you need or or whatever right and so the belief system is also crumbling. And that's part of the demolition process overall is that we're, we're losing our, our old our old identity, but but that's falling apart through the crumbling of what was through built through all of the illusions that put on by society and the, the, the false identity that was created. And and that's that's really like part of that was being built through these belief systems. And so those falling apart, they don't just you don't just crush them down like, hey, you know, that that's not working. It's like, but it, that was part of my identity. And so, and then part of like, so ingrained in, into everything I am was that belief and, and driving things. And it's like the thread that holds the structure together in some ways is the belief systems. And so that's all coming apart when it, when it comes down. And so the defects, it's like, yeah, that that's something. Cause it's like, it's coming at our pride, but on a deeper level, it's like the belief system is starting to crumble and with it are our false identity. And that process is like, it's pretty, 
it's pretty big and it's pretty deep and there's a lot of things happening on a psychological level and a spiritual level. Um, so of course, like it's human reaction to, to get defensive and, and not to just absorb immediately what the person's saying because, because of those things. And what's happening is exactly what she's saying. Like step three, build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Take away these difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, thy way of life. So what's happening as we have the crumbling of these old belief systems, um, we're being rebuilt. But the rebuild within us is like a rebuild in this building. If they rebuild this building, they got to strip it down and demolish it. So that demolishing and rebuilding within me is fucking painful and it hurts. But I have to have this blind faith that the rebuild of this building, when they put on the new walls and the new lights and the new door handles and new windows, that it's going to be the most beautiful place that it's ever been. And it's kind of like I have to have that blind faith that I'm going to be better than I've ever been, too. And to kind of trust that is really, really hard because a lot of these, like she said, are really ingrained through society. And letting that go is hard. That victory over them. You know, that's why it's so important that we rely on God as we're going through this dismantling process, because I need to be victorious and left to my own devices. I'll go back to what I already always know and always do. So to trust sponsors and pillars and God is really important because they're the ones that can help hold hold our hand and, and kind of guide us through it. Sometimes it's like I was thinking about the complacency that we were talking about last week or the week before about how sometimes we just don't know that where we're at can get better. And um, I was having this conversation with a sponsee recently, and I can't remember really what the context was, but oh yeah, she was holding on to the situation because it brought in a little bit of income. Like we're talking like 400 bucks. And so I was like, seriously, this is your thing is 400 bucks. I'm like, don't you think God is bigger than 400 bucks? Then we were both quiet. She's like, yeah, hey. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, man. But it's like from the perspective of what we've done before, where we were kind of operating as our own God and we were solving our own problems, that 400 bucks extra a month seems like a good idea. But when it's like coming up against our emotional sobriety because we're operating somewhat in defects or maybe a lot in defects, and it's like the 400 bucks is worth F.A., like, let it go because God is bigger than 400 bucks or whatever your higher power is. Like, God has it figured out that if you are to let go of the 400 bucks, there will be something better. And uh, that we, we had a laugh over that because it was just like, when you say it like that, it's so ridiculous. Like, of course, there's a better, there's a better over that hill of whatever it is you got to climb. There's going to be something better than 400 bucks like that. That's setting the bar pretty low for a higher power's job, right? And what you have faith in. So. And when we, it was just, it was a funny moment because like when we broke it all down, of course, God is bigger than the things we're holding on to. And a lot of times it is as silly or as little as, as the 400 bucks. And like in my, as I form like new relationships with friendships and like with like uh, dating and, and the relationship I want for myself, it's like, I have to remember that because I, I had a pattern of like, like I talked about caretaking and rescuing and, and believe like falling in love with their potential, I guess, to sum it up. And it's like, I was selling myself short and the bar was always being set so low. And like, it's like, well, it's good enough. At least it's not da, 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 da. And so to switch that whole belief around with like all of area, all the areas of my life, like that, the bar that I have for myself, the standard, even when it's high, it's still low. For my higher power and for what I if I just hold on and hold out for the things that I know that are good for me that I can't even imagine myself being in like I this for, for the people who have been kind of following my work stuff it's been a it has been a, a ride emotionally and like spiritually mostly just like letting go of these opportunities that that come in front of me and like there's been a couple that I almost took just because it was like you know how how much can I play with like time and I need to pay my bills at some point, but it just it not sitting right and it not feeling like that feeling that I am looking for where like I knew intuitively I need to be needed to be in Calgary. I had an intuitive thought and and it didn't lead me astray. And I've had that a couple of times and I know like I'm learning how to follow that. 
And so to let things go, even though they seem good, and I have to remind myself in the same way, kind of like, I need to just let it go and know that there's something better for me. And it hasn't let anybody down around me that does this stuff. And I like, I don't see somebody being like, yeah, and then I held out and I was totally disappointed. And like, it seems to work out for people. So to just hold on to that and believe that there's something better, better than what my own human mind can imagine for myself, if I just do what I'm supposed to be doing. And so it's been like a, like that for me and, and things do get better and things are falling into place and it makes it worth it. And in, in ways that I seriously, like I couldn't, I couldn't plan for myself, like the stuff that's come up, it was an accidental swipe of a, like, I'm going to throw my resume here because I'm on Indeed and it's easy. And then a couple months later, this place I forgot about calls me and um, like it, I'm still like, this seems like it's a cat, like, I don't know about this. And so, so far it's still, it's still a thing. And it's like to trust in that is really freaky because I have never lived my life in a way that I'm just like following intuition. I'm following my belief systems and my, my peers that aren't doing the same thing. They're telling me what to do and what not to do. And I'm going right along. And it's a, it's a really foreign process, but I watch people do it and I look in the literature and, and it like day at a time I, I do it. And so yeah, God is bigger than 400 bucks. Yeah. Now to touch base on something Janine already did also, as we go into page 45 of temperamentally, we're on the depressive side. You got to know if you're on the depressive side. Are you a depressive person? Do you suffer a lot of anxiety? Or are you maybe sometimes a depressive person? Me, my disposition is not depressive too often, but I can fall in there, okay? Apt to be swamped with guilt and self-loathing. A lot of people wear the badge of guilt, but they won't outright say that because this defect here in this paragraph, this is the most cunning of all defects. This is what we call martyrdom, victim, and uh, self-pity. Okay, Janine talked a lot about the self-pity, but I like to kind of twist it into like martyrdom and being the victim. And we can't often see that. And when we do see it, we're liable to suffer severe reactions because we didn't think that we were that. We kind of balk at that going, holy fuck, that can't be me. But when we get rigorously honest, and rigorous means accurate, we're like, holy shit, I'm playing the victim here. And it's a cunning one, and it'll fuck you up. Um, as we get a mishap and a painful pleasure out of it. And you got to think about in your own life where you're the victim or where your self-pity is kind of there. And you got to think about, do I get kind of a sense of like pleasure out of that? Like a soul sickness pleasure? And we do because it's a comfortable place. We know what it fucking feels like. And we, we like the comfort of it. Even though if you asked me if I would like being there, I'd say, fuck no, who would? That's just my pride actually answering that. Because when I get honest, Fuck, maybe I do like it. But we got to admit that shit. And that sometimes is a severe reaction, right? Um, as we morbidly pursue this melancholy activity. So then, you know, nothing's treating me right. These fucking people, they don't fucking care. No one really cares about me. Fucking, you know, like Janine said, like on Facebook, when you put this shit on Facebook, and you got to ask yourself, why do you put the shit you put on Facebook? What are you trying to get out of it? That's a really important question of what you should ask yourself when you're putting shit on Facebook. Are you looking for validation? Are you looking for someone to co-sign your fucking bullshit? Are you looking to fucking be on the top? Are you looking, what are you looking for? Okay. It's just a good idea to look at that. So I have a sponsee that I've been working with for quite a little while. And one of the things I said was, I want you to fucking knock off your Facebook. Tone it right the fuck down because you're not getting fucking anywhere by the responses that you get back on Facebook. You're not growing. It's holding you in this little fucking box and you're getting all this validation that you don't fucking need because it's not the right fucking kind. So they revamped their whole posting structure of what they do. And lo and behold, fucking few months down the road, it's like, holy fuck, I feel free. And I'm not getting all the feedback that I was. And 
you know, and it's like, make your circle smaller with fucking like good people. You don't need to be fucking everything to everybody. You don't need to be transparent to everybody either. That's what pillars are for. Okay. So we can, we can like ease a lot of the craziness in our mind by being aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. I know women in the program that get up and they go for fucking three, three pisses in an hour. They're fucking up grabbing fucking coffee and cookies. It ain't because they're fucking bladders out of control and they're fucking thirsty and hungry. It's because they want the fucking guys in the room to fucking watch them and notice them. I've seen the same thing with guys. And we got to ask ourselves, why the fuck do I need to get up three or five times during a fucking meeting when I'm here to fucking help save people's lives? Right? Like notice these things and notice those people that are doing it. Because when you notice them, you'll notice yourself. And I don't mean notice them from a judgmental point of view. Just notice them from an observational point of view, because that's what step six is about. Sometimes we got to see it in others so we can see it in ourselves. And if you are judging them, then you got work to do. And there's a good opportunity to bring God in and ask for them what you would want for yourself or God remove this defect of judgment or whatever. So everything in your life can be a lesson. Every single thing can be a teacher. And as you become aware, because as you become aware, you rise your consciousness, you become closer to God in every step of that way. So blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to skip down for this is pride in reverse. So a lot of us think pride is like being grandiose. Okay. Pride in reverse is like the self-pity stuff. And I'm going to define ego like this. Ego can be over the top or ego can be beneath the bottom mm -hmm. over the top or beneath okay either one the 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 main thing about the ego is its absence of god ego edging god out it's i am acting in a fear-based idea or decision i'm looking for something on either side of that coin and if it's based out of fear then it's the fucking ego period but if you, you can do the exact same act and it's not based in fear, then it's not your ego. So it's aligning your will with God's will. Okay. So you can be at one year sobriety hitting on all these women or all these men and the motive is self and you want the validation and you like the fucking um, attention that you get and blah, 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 blah. And it's ego because it's all fear-based and you're looking for the attention and you're looking out for all the validation. Go five years ahead. You've done all this work, same exact person, same exact scenario. Now you're interacting with men or women, whatever the case may be, but your motives are pure and you're not looking for anything, but to the outside person who's looking at you, it looks like you're doing the same thing, but you've changed fundamentally on who you are. There's a measure of humility at the five-year mark where you're not actually looking for the validation. You're just actually engaging and being truthful and fucking talking to people. And you're not the same person that you were in year one, but to the person watching, it might look like the same thing, but that doesn't matter. Because as long as you're good with you, when I ask you at one year, okay, what are you doing? And you justify and rationalize everything that I'm asking you. But at five years, you tell me, I'm just talking to people. You don't need to justify the truth. That's what Janine was talking about earlier. When you're walking authentically in that aspect of who you are, you don't need to justify the truth to anybody. And there's a peace of mind of that that is fucking unexplainable. Do you want me to read? Go. Okay. Um, are we here? If, however. If, however, our natural disposition is inclined to self-righteousness or grandiosity, our reaction will be just the opposite. We will be offended at a suggested inventory. No doubt we shall pride. We shall point with pride to the good lives we thought we had before the bottle cut us down. We shall claim that our serious character defects, if we think we have any at all, could have been caused chiefly by excessive drinking. That being so, we think it logically follows that sobriety, first, last, and all the time, is the only thing we need to work for. We believe that our one-time good characters will be revived the minute we quit alcohol. If we were pretty nice people all along, except for our drinking, what need is there for a moral inventory now that we're sober? 
We also clutch at another wonderful excuse for avoiding an inventory. Our present anxieties and troubles, we cry, are caused by the behavior of other people, people who really need a moral inventory. We firmly believe that if only they'd treat us better, we'd be all right. We'd, we'd think that our indignation and justified and reasonable, that our resentments are the right kind. We aren't guilty ones, they are. At this stage of the recovery proceedings, our sponsors come to us to the rescue. They can do this for they are the carriers of A's tested experience with step four. They comfort the melancholy one by first showing him that his case is not strange or different, that his defects are probably not more numerous or worse than those of anyone else in AA. This sponsor promptly proves by talking freely and easily and without exhibitionism about his own defects past and present. This calm yet realistic stock taking is immensely reassuring. The sponsor probably points out that there's that the newcomer has some assets which can be noted along with his liabilities. This tends to clear away mor morbidity and encourage balance. As soon as he begins to be more objective, the newcomer can fearlessly rather than fearfully look at his own defects. The sponsor of who those feel that there needs to be no inventory are confronted with quite another problem. This is because people who are driven by pride of self unconsciously blind themselves to their liabilities. These newcomers scarcely need comforting. The problem is to help them discover the chink in their walls of their ego has built through which the light of reason can shine. First off, they can be told that the majority of AA members have suffered severely from self-justification during their drinking days. For most of us, self-justification was the maker of excuses, excuses, of course, for more drinking and for all kinds of crazy and damaging conduct. We have made the, invent the invention of alibis a fine art. We had to drink because times are hard or times are good. We had to drink because at home we were smothered with love or got none at all. We had to drink because at work we were great success or dismal fail failures. We had to drink because our nation had won a war, lost a peace, and so it went ad, infin ad infinitum. We thought conditions drove us to drink, and when we tried to correct these conditions, we found that we couldn't do to our satisfaction. Our drinking went out of hand and we became alcoholics. Never occurred to us that we needed to change ourselves to meet conditions, whatever they were. Okay. So going back to 46 for a second, this is the last big thing that I think that we'll talk about or that I'll talk about at least. Mm -hmm. The sponsors of those, so 46, three quarters of the way down. The sponsors of those who feel that need no inventory are confronted with quite another problem. This is because people who are driven by pride of self, <clears throat> sorry, unconsciously blind themselves to their liabilities. That is like a huge thing. We will unconsciously blind ourselves to the liabilities that are fucking us. And this is what we call, you can't see self from self. This is where we rationalize and justify a lot of things, maybe outside of ourselves, but mostly inside of ourselves. And we, the problem is to help them discover the chink in the walls of their ego, that their ego is built through which the light of reason can shine. So this can be trauma, it can be belief systems, or it can just be mechanisms of defective character. So when you're working with somebody, or if I'm working with somebody, and I need to kind of get through in an area, let's just say it's a belief system, or it's a trauma. Over the years, they've never thought that this belief system was wrong. They've always thought it was right. Okay, or the trauma that they're basing the belief systems in. So as you have like a thick wall, let's say the ego is built a wall, okay? And some of the belief systems that we can get through have like maybe a six inch concrete wall and it's got like um, 16 millimeter rebar, which is the thin rebar. And the MPA, which is strength of concrete is like a 15 MPA strength of concrete. So that's not very strong concrete and the rebar isn't very thick. So the wall's not that strong. But it's still there and, it pen and it's hard to penetrate. But if you start chipping at a 15 MPA concrete, you can start chipping it. And within a little bit of time, you're kind of through the other side. And on the other side, there was darkness. Now a little bit of light of reason shines through that. Okay. But now you're dealing with old belief systems or real heavy traumas or, or deeply ingrained things that you have in your life. Now that same wall is now... 45 MPA concrete, which is super strong. And the thing about concrete is concrete gets harder over time. 
So if I poured a wall of concrete today, every fucking day for the next 50 years, the concrete actually gets stronger and stronger as time goes on. And this concrete that we're talking about now today has like 35 millimeter concrete, which makes the wall even stronger. So if I start chipping at this concrete, it's just like I'm hitting a, a, a wall. It's like tank, tank, tank. And no, no concrete kind of breaks off. It's just I'm hitting a wall and nothing's happening. But if I say persistent at this chipping of this concrete, eventually I start a little tiny divot, a little tiny divot. And then it starts, little powder starts breaking off. And over time, over time, over time, I create a big divot in this wall. Might take a long time, but I'm making progress. And by the time I'm almost through the wall, finally I'm almost through the wall, boom. Now a big chunk on the far side breaks open. And now that as I hit the start of the hole on the other side, the chunks break off bigger now. And that little bit of light that shines into the dark actually illuminates a lot of the darkness behind the wall. And so that's kind of the job of a sponsor. And that's the job of a sponsee to be willing and honest and persistent enough with the people around me to work on these things so that I can keep an open mind and see that I might need to change an idea or belief system or work on a trauma that's really holding me back. Do I have a hard time interacting with society? Do I have a hard time interacting with the opposite sex? Do I have um, tough times with whatever? Or am I over exuberant and overcompensating because of my insecurities? So whatever it is that you need to work with, it's kind of whatever it is that you need to find about, find out about yourself is whatever the defect is. For me, I was really rigid and angry, and I would never let anyone into my life. And for me to chop through that concrete, it took a fucking lot of work and a lot of time and lots of sponsors that were fucking hard on me. But I was willing to take a lot of that, right? A lot of people won't take that, and their pride gets hurt because they don't like what they hear, so they fuck off. So the instincts balk at investigation. And the minute they were trying to probe those things, they fuck off. So the thing about working on these defects is you can't fuck off. You have to be have an open mind to be able to listen to people, even though you might think they're wrong. You should always listen to what somebody says there because there is something in what they say that you can listen to and, and take some value of and work on. And especially people that have been doing this that really care that you know and see around. So that's what I'll say about that. So the ego is built and which we can find the light of reason can shine. Anything? No, but you did a really good job not swearing. Till uh, three in a row. Oh, I missed that. I was counting my own. I failed. Yeah, so no, that that's good. I think we'll end there. And that is that gonna wrap us out up out of step four? No, we still got like oh dear. Lots. So two we, more sessions. Two more one. sessions. Okay.